All right. Thank you, guys. Um, I'm going to start with a thank you for coming. I know it's late in the afternoon. As they all say, I'm standing between you and happy hour. Uh, also, I know there is a ton of great stuff to do here and great presentation, so I appreciate you for giving me a little bit of your time to try to make it worth it. Um, my primary objective here, we've got 30 minutes, so we're not solving world hunger, as you can imagine. <laughs> my primary objective here today is to try to give you a bit of a mini framework on how to start tackling this um, really rapidly and ever-expanding legal risk uh, that is escalating uh, as we speak. <laughs> Um, to give you a few uh, ideas on how to tackle it and uh, reinforce why it's critical to start integrating that into your cyber programs and um, operations, and et cetera. So let's jump in. All right. The lawyers are right. We managed to go pretty much all of cybersecurity history without the lawyers sticking their nose into everything, right? <laughs> Since I am a lawyer, I'm going to say, um, they're here, we all know that, we're all feeling it, right? But I'm gonna say, there's a little bit of good and there's a little bit of bad. So I'll start with the bad. The bad is that um, uh, probably most of us are feeling it is chaos. We got regulation coming in every direction. We have legislation coming down every direction. Uh, we've got lawsuits flying and believe me, they have just begun. We're gonna talk a little bit about where those are gonna start coming from and all the angles. Um, so, uh, it's very challenging for folks who are already inundated and have too many day jobs to start getting their arms around that and to mitigate it. Adding to the problem, and the bad is, I'm sure we're all experiencing, there are suddenly a bunch of cybersecurity lawyers that really don't have cybersecurity experience. Happens in every profession, we're all uh, feeling it. Um, what that translates, though, to is bad law that does not make our lives easier, a lot of lawsuits that divert resources from security, which is, needs to remain our priority. The good, for those who do know what they're doing, uh, they are, we are your best advocates to help you get what you need, um, get your programs uh, designed the way you need to design them to mitigate that risk and hold off the bad part of it, right? Uh, the other thing is that, uh, if you want uh, to get your priorities prioritized and get all those things you've been screaming into the void are critical done, the fast track to that is for the lawyers and shareholder value to become a risk. <laughs> and that's happening. <laughs> so that's some good news. Um, and then the last piece is, I'm gonna get a little bit into it a little bit more further along, is uh, the lesson learned. Uh, I come from grid sector. Uh, we've been heavily regulated, full framework, cyber regulated, and physical security uh, under those NERC SIP regulations. We're going to talk about those, so everybody who's had to deal with that is rolling their eyes now. We'll get back to it. But uh, for 15 plus years, and before that, we had uh, voluntary urgent action standards. Um, what we learned, a uh, piece of what we learned was that the lawyers weren't at the table when those regulations were getting written. Uh, and it meant that when they went to get enforced, we had a lot of challenges. So I, I will say that some of the good is if we start integrating the lawyers now, we can get better regulation, we can get better risk mitigation across contract terms and other things, and we're going to talk about some of that. So one more note, financial market and credit has also entered the chat. <laughs> Moody's dropped this report last fall. They, they went out to every board, they went out to every C-suite, everybody knows now cybersecurity risk can have a major impact on your shareholder value. Uh, we've got the SEC regs that have come down, the disclosure regs, which kind of make the C-suite accountable, not completely, they're a little bit soft, but they're, they'll evolve. Um, all of that means that uh, that other part of the fast track to getting what you want done and getting your priorities prioritized, uh, this is the other half of that, so that's all happening. Um, the challenge, of course, as you guys probably well know, is uh, keeping it enough at bay to make sure that the real security priority remains the priority and not some of the other things that people who don't really understand security well enough but now are suddenly very concerned aren't defining it completely. So let's get to the cybersecurity legal risk landscape. I mentioned a little bit of a framework for how to start thinking about it. I like to break it up into two kind of lanes. Uh, 
they're all interconnected. You know, the, the title here is OT regulation, but all of the legal risk is in, very interconnected. And I'm going to try to leave you with some ideas on how to use the regulatory side, which everybody hates, um, as a shield and to help improve and mitigate the other risks. So if you break it into two lanes, you've got regulation. It's coming from every direction we mentioned. I'll talk a little bit further up about how to start getting your arms around that. Um, and then I like to think of it, the other lane is just kind of those other legal risks, which a lot of people don't pay a lot of attention to and have only started and or don't notice until they get sued. Uh, but product and services agreements, uh, um, insurance policies, in those two cases, uh, you've got um, history of people copy-pasting cyber framework terms into agreements. I know, because I've been the lawyer who got handed agreement and said, what is this? This is going to be a nightmare when you go to enforce it if it turns into a lawsuit. Because voluntary frameworks, which I'm going to talk about in a second, were not uh, written for legal constructs. So you have contract lawyers who just copy-pasted those in. Now those are kind of coming to life in lawsuits. Uh, and some of it is driven by that shareholder obligation piece. So as shareholders start to go, wait a minute, you should have done more for cybersecurity even if they don't know what that looked like, some lawyer is going to volunteer to file that class action shareholder suit and blame the cybersecurity program and all the failures, et cetera. So that is a lane that we need to be continuously focusing on and escalate as a priority. And then supply chain, of course, crosses both. You've got regulation coming down, and then you've got supply chain requirements that roll through all of that. One more note, um, how to think about that distinction and why I break them up this way is that regulatory and legislative, the enforcement is through government, agency oversight, enforcement protocols, programs. In my sector, uh, our agency has $1 million per day per violation penalty authority. That gets people's attention. So, uh, so that forced, uh, you know, there's a lot of folks who have beef with how it all went down, but that forced uh, a transition to a much more rigorous implementation of cybersecurity programs. Uh, implementation is through compliance programs. Absolutely have to have governance and compliance management to ensure that those controls are getting executed. And then, of course, the actual executing controls, your patch management program, your access management controls, all of that. And then penalties vary. Um, we say, as lawyers, the law is only as good as its enforcement. So it depends on the enforcer, how they're enforcing it, how seriously people take it, and, and then that trickles down. Uh, financial penalties, regulatory directives, um, those are some of the most more painful ones because that's the regulator telling you what you should do, and that's something you try to avoid. On the other lane, it's mostly enforced through private party contract terms, negotiations, settlements, uh, civil litigation, that's when we're getting into potentially a lot of money wasted that could be used for better for security programs. Um, and then implementation is mostly the way you do it for voluntary programs, internal controls, risk management, et cetera. So if you think about it that way, it'll make it a little bit easier to start getting your arms around it. On the danger zone, uh, guard your flank. This is something that too many people are just not thinking about. So I mentioned a few minutes ago that a lot of contracts and services agreements, especially in the last two years, um, have popped up where people have uh, put in a little cybersecurity appendix. And what they did was they went out to one of the frameworks, NIST, ISO, um, and they copy-pasted in. And some of them, by the way, are information security specific. Uh, Privacy is not security, security is not privacy, and information security is not always good security because it depends on who is leading it and whether they're leading from a privacy perspective. And if so, they're gonna have gaps in the security program. So there's this mishmash of all of that that has been pasted into the agreements. Uh, same thing with insurance policies, same thing is happening there. So what happens when the lawsuit comes down or it goes to get enforced? Um, that voluntary language is too loosey-goosey to really enforce meaningfully. So it gets, you, you end up in a big fight. It's the battle of the SMEs. I've got a, a point on that in here. Um, 
And that is going to be a major risk area for a lot of organizations. So the one piece of advice on that is to pay more attention to that and make sure that you're getting good counsel that does have some cybersecurity credentials to take a look at it and think through the implications of the way that term is written and what's gonna happen when it shows up in a lawsuit. That's a big blind spot for a lot of organizations. And this is just a continuation of that concept that those uh, voluntary is not mandatory. Um, not only is the language extremely flexible, but the other thing is that those contract terms, like some of the very flexible regulations that are coming down, um, say things like have a plan, follow it, basically. That's our generic. Have a plan, follow it. Make sure you have a good plan. Make sure you have a good program. Um, when, you, uh, when you have a setup like that, the design of your controls to actually execute and meet that legal or regulatory obligation, the legal obligation in the contract, the legal or regulatory obligation in the law, can be come, come out a million different ways. It can be designed very flexibly internally, and that becomes a nightmare for you when you need to prove that you did it. And that's really where there's going to be a lot of challenges when you when you hit it. So these are just really important things to start thinking about and start looking at differently in your own programs and your own approach. So no narc sip. Uh, I've got the we know we know because I don't think I talk to a single SME who doesn't roll their eyes when they hear narc sip. They hate it. <laughs> I know you hate it. Uh, I've been a regulatory lawyer for 20 plus years. And I will say, nobody wants to hear it, but NERC is actually one of the regulatory schemes that is the most collaborative, the best from the perspe my perspective as a lawyer, because we actually get a meaningful seat at the table to design that regulation and get it figured out. That said, um, like I mentioned earlier, in the early days, uh, there weren't very many lawyers at the table, and one of the lessons we learned was, because we weren't at the table, the language was written by the SMEs. Fantastic. They know what they're talking about. They know what they're doing with regard to the cybersecurity and the technical. They don't understand how uh, when they said, well, you know what we meant. <laughs> that wasn't going to work when you got audited and when you ended up in the lawsuit. So a lot of the language when it's written by the technical expert and not also written together with the lawyer has a lot of what we call assumption in the reader. You know what we meant. And that becomes a huge fight. So a few, so that's something that I harp on because I'm the lawyer and that's what I have to harp on, but let's talk about a couple of the critical lessons learned um, that are really important, again, as regulation and other legal obligations come down. These are some big traps that you can avoid if you're paying attention. Uh, inventory of requirements and assets, and I'm gonna dive into some of these in more detail in a second. Uh, critical foundation, we hear about it all the time. Uh, I gotta say, it is still really surprising to me when I'm working with organizations how many of them just do not have a good inventory of their cyber assets, of their critical cyber assets, uh, of their supply chain, uh, vendors, products, software, all of that. Um, and I understand that if you are not starting today, your business today, um, that it's really hard to go back in time and build that. But we do have some models uh, in many sectors, and in mine I'll talk about a couple, uh, for accomplishing that, and it is absolutely critical. You can't mitigate your risk if you don't know what you have. You cannot uh, manage uh, incident response effectively if you don't know what you have. You can't improve or mature your program if you really don't know what you have and where your risks are. Risk-based. That was something that a lot of our Industry said when the first uh, version of the NERC uh, CIP, CIP, Critical Infrastructure Protection Standards, came down, wasn't done well enough. And there was a lot of work over the years as the standards evolved to try to get that into a better place. Uh, it has to be risk-based. We absolutely don't want to replace paper tiger checkbox exercises and process evidence we don't want to replace good security with that. And that is the challenge if you don't have a risk base. It's got to be focused on, the other thing is we have a lot. We have a lot of assets, we have a lot of issues, we have a lot of challenges. Anybody who's running um, threat monitoring knows there, there's no way you can keep up with all of this. So we have to prioritize. So how are we going to do it? It's got to be risk based. Um, I already talked about the voluntary versus mandatory, but I'm going to get into more of that in the Battle of the SMEs. So, 
on the inventory. Um, a keynote here, you need an inventory of your legal obligations in addition to your assets. So you might be thinking about it from, um, as a cybersecurity expert, you'd be thinking about your assets, but now that the lawyers have arrived and entered the chat, we need to be thinking about how in the world do I get my arms around all this legal risk? And a lot, a lot of people are really overwhelmed by that. Um, I can tell you from experience building programs out of conflicting regulations, federal, local, state, global, uh, in certain areas, that the best way to do it is to get a strong inventory, uh, pull down the requirements from your most important, most enforcing regulators, start there, and prioritize those, uh, and then uh, work your way through. The good thing about cyber, unlike some of the other regulatory areas, is that most of them are built off of the frameworks that we're all used to working in, NIST and ISO and all those. So the cyber regs, for the most part, and your, your compliance to them can be more easily aligned than in some regulatory areas. Doesn't feel like that if you're trying to, to get to all of these. Um, and the other good thing about cyber is a lot of the agencies that are putting out um, in, uh, regulations are making an effort, at least, to design and drop with them some crosswalks to help make your life a little bit easier, leverage those resources. You have to look at them specific to your program, but they're good. So risk-based is a thing in the legal construct as well as with regard to your assets and operations, and think that way. Um, and then uh, don't forget in your asset inventory to be thinking about it, hardware, software, services, because supply chain risk uh, is very intricately uh, intertwined with cyber risk and is going to be a very big area for legal, uh, the legal fights and the legal battles. And some of those lawsuits have just started dropping where uh, I think we just saw the other day one of the big law firms sued their uh, managed services provider for not having good cybersecurity. That managed service provider is most certainly going to follow the old legal sue them all, sort it out later approach and start suing everybody, the, the software, the hardware, everybody that's involved. That's gonna happen in every uh, scenario. So, uh, so you need to have a good understanding of those and then you need to take a risk-based approach. And let me touch on that real quick because I mentioned the model. So years ago we had this thing, the Northeast blackout, just a little outage in the whole of the Northeast. Uh, and out of that came the regulations for the bulk power system. Uh, both reliable operations and the security regulations that we've been living with since. Um, the reliable operations uh, in that process and a few years later, uh, one of the things they found was that our actual conditions in the field didn't necessarily match the designs back in the design room and we had modeled risk for operation of the system, to simplify this, to the design. And so they went, uh-oh, this could be a huge problem. We need you to go out and fix that. Everybody knew that was thousands of elements on the system from a physical standpoint. So we took an approach. We're gonna prioritize the most critical, we're gonna triage this across a series of years, and then we're going to slowly uh, rebuild those uh, element ratings and all of this to get that inventory in shape. That is the way you need to do it if you're trying to inventory legacy, you've been around, uh, you just don't have a good inventory, prioritize and just go through across. And if you're doing that, I'm gonna tell you, if I were your lawyer, I would leverage that approach to argue that you are a good compliance, good legal citizen, you are doing and going above and beyond because you've made that effort. But if you, ha if you don't have a plan at all, it's harder to defend that you didn't know where your assets were. All right, um, on, the, uh, on the, a couple of the other lessons learned. Uh, voluntary equals flexible. So when we transitioned from NIST and the voluntary frameworks to a regulated framework where we were getting audited, spot checked, when I tell you NERC is one of the most uh, rigorous uh, regulators for enforcement of their regulations, I mean it. Like, <laughs> And I think NRC of course tops them, but NRC is like embedded in the nuclear plants. So, uh, so we learned uh, in that process uh, that we weren't uh, quite in as good a shape as we thought with our voluntary programs. Now, mind you, this was many years before. A lot of people do do voluntary better now than we did back then. But I promise you, if you're, if you're running a voluntary program and you don't have a, an internal governance and compliance function that is very rigorous, uh, 
you are not doing what you think you're doing, you are not executing consistently, and you probably will not be able to prove that you did these things even when you did. And that's a big lesson learned when you transition from voluntary to mandatory. So the, the piece here for you is that if you're not regulated, but you want to mitigate legal risk, you need to think about it that way. Do I have good controls? Um, do people understand, apply, and, and implement them consistently in the same way? Uh, do they follow what's written in the process or control? And could I prove that it got executed if I ended up in a lawsuit? That's the way you have to think about it. And then um, you'll see I note there the have a plan, follow it. That's a trap. Okay, if you have a control that says, um, or a regulation or a term in a contract that says, uh, have a program, uh, and it doesn't usually say follow, it just says, you must implement a program to do this. That's a trap, because what one SME says is a good program for that is completely different from what another SME says, and I have those questions on there because that's the analogy I always give. If I ask, let's just say for the sake of argument, and I'm simplifying this, if I ask five patching SMEs, what's the best way to design a patch program, how often should we evaluate them, um, how often should we mitigate, you know, when should we review the program? I'm gonna get 10 answers from those five SMEs. And tomorrow, I'm gonna get 10 new ones from those very five SMEs. And if you understand that, then you understand that if you just have a program that says, hey, we patch and we evaluated this, those SMEs that are executing it are gonna read it completely different, they're gonna execute it differently. So there's a trick to balancing not being over restrictive, allowing the flexibility that is needed, allowing the discretion that is needed, but protecting yourself from that legal fight when you put the SMEs across the table from each other. All right, so IT versus OT is the title of the session is OT regulation. The thing about cybersecurity, and one of the things I love about it is it's the same language in every, in every country, in every space, in every sector. We're doing basically the same things. We're thinking about it the same way, et cetera. The controls are the same. IT versus OT, a little bit different, right? Um, and it depends on the organization. A uh, few key considerations. Of, for regulatory purposes, the regulation's gonna be written in many cases without regard to what assets uh, and how you've got it set up and whether they're segregated, et cetera. How you implement and apply that will differ um, and may differ. Uh, but a few key considerations, OT assets, because a lot of them are operational and uh, running the most critical functions of the business, are the big focus for regulators in some cases. So um, when they're implementing, and in, I mean, sorry, when they're writing and then enforcing regulation, that's where they're gonna go for starters in a lot of cases. So make sure that you've thought about any distinctions in how you're set up and how your programs are designed to account for the fact that you're, you may have to prove compliance in a different way and even implement some of the controls in a different way for OT assets versus IT assets. Um, and then the other big challenge is that they're increasingly not segregated depending on the sector. We were talking earlier about the renewable sector. I love my renewable guys that tell me we have no IT, which is completely impossible, but okay. But there, um, but there is a lot of, with cloud and you know, a lot of hype movement towards hybrid, now with all the big threats uh, and the, the advisory that dropped uh, last week, a lot of people are backing off some of that and going, maybe we should stay segregated, but it's, it's kind of just uh, fluid, right? There's a lot of different strategies here. But back in the days, especially in critical infrastructure, it, it was a cleaner line. It was more segregated, now it's not. So, um, so you have to think through, uh, how does my OT program look? And does it look the way those old school OT programs look? Probably not, and you definitely have to think about those uh, kind of cross implications. And then the crisis opportunities. Um, many OT assets for critical infrastructure are not easily updated or secured. We all know that. I don't have to tell you guys that. They are OT after all. Um, and that, again, means you're going to have to approach the legal risk, the legal thinking, the term in that contract that says um, have a patch management program. What does that mean for your OT assets versus your IT assets? How are you going to defend it? How are you going to prove it? How are you going to establish that you met that legal obligation? 
um, back in the days when lawyers weren't all in the mix and everybody wasn't suing everybody, uh, which is just starting, it's going to get much worse, trust me. Um, you didn't have to think through that through, you didn't have to think about it that way, you didn't have to think that through because you weren't gonna get sued. The risk of getting sued was so low that you could take it. That's not the case anymore, so now you do need to be thinking about that. And then the legacy asset challenges, um, which present unique supply chain issues, is another thing to think about, right? So we talked about inventory, how do you get your arms around an inventory when you have a lot of assets that are already out there and, um, and you don't have time. You just don't have time to do all of that. Uh, you also have to think about it from the perspective of, with the OT assets, what are the additional risks and have I taken um, steps to mitigate security risk with assets that I can't get a line of sight to the supply chain in. One of the most obvious examples that uh, we talk about is um, adjusting your threat monitoring to monitor for inter internal network and internal threats to spot anomalies more quickly. And that cyber advisory actually got into some of that and some of the things you could do to catch uh, unique issues. Um, one final note on certification programs. <clears throat> so, I'm in the room with a lot of vendors <laughs> as well, I'm sure, and many people are offering managed services certification programs, so I've got advice for both sides. Uh, one of which is that um, if you're, uh, many of the certification programs and many of the managed services programs were not set up uh, to mitigate and account for the legal risk associated with what they're doing. So for example, if you're getting an assessment, uh, internal assessment provided by a vendor and or getting a certification from them, a lot of them push out a questionnaire, maybe even an automated one, um, say fill that out and then they collect a piece of paper and then they sign you off. Because that was good enough to say at least you're doing some basic cyber hygiene, you're doing something. That is not gonna hold up and that is not gonna protect you in a lawsuit with a lawyer who has a clue because they're not gonna accept that checkbox check box answer in the questionnaire and your piece of paper. They're gonna dig into the controls, they're gonna audit you and investigate the issue just like a regulator would. And by the way, when lawyers issue discovery, unlike our regulators, so one thing about the regulations is you have a seat at the table with most regulators, even if you hate your regulators. You have a seat at the table with them, you can get involved in the rulemaking process, you can negotiate when they start enforcing, you can negotiate with them. And in most cases, their underlying objective is security, not to penalize you. Smees <laughs> don't always believe that, but it's true. So if that, so you have that. With a lawyer who just wants to uh, sue on behalf of their client, advocate zealously and or make money, you don't have that. They're gonna issue a discovery request and say, give me everything you've ever done for cybersecurity. Give me every assessment you've ever done. Give me every, they're gonna, so remember that when you're signing up for these programs and we're, when you're going through these contracts because all of that stuff's gonna get requested. Um, so don't over rely on these things uh, to defend yourself. And I did mention and did not come back to the regulation. You can use the regulation as a shield of sorts. Because um, one of the things in the lawsuits that's going to be a big challenge for both sides is that there isn't really a standard. Okay, we're gonna, we can argue about, okay, the frameworks are a standard, we know that. But they have not been uh, legal tested. Um, so these battles that we have to get into with all the SMEs means there's no real standardization for what's the best patch management program and what is reasonable, which as a, for lawyers that's great because that gives us a lot of gray to work in to defend and drive our position. Um, but it does mean that, um, that it makes it hard for you also to say what I did was reasonable, especially to a jury or a judge who doesn't know anything about cybersecurity. But the regulations, if you're following and complying to a set of regulations from your regulators, that's the first place you start. I'm doing this, I'm complying to this, and use it to insulate yourself somewhat. It's not a complete shield, but it's a start. It's a good start. So there's the pro for the regulation. Um, so the point here on these is don't over rely on these. Keep in mind when you're doing the assessment certifications. The other thing is automated assessments. I know they can be fantastic if you're dealing with an experienced cybersecurity team. If you are dealing with a less mature organization and I ask you the question, do you have a patch management program? If I'm not there to guide you through that questionnaire as a human, it's gonna be a garbage in, garbage out problem. So that could further complicate how much value that has for you. 
uh, it is not to say don't use them, it's to say start using them more smartly, all of these tools. And if you are a vendor in this space, start doing it more smartly and start thinking about the fact that when someone gets sued, they're gonna point to you and say, you helped me feel confident about my cybersecurity program and that I was in good shape. Come on over and join the lawsuit. Uh, and then uh, they are not regulatory audits. So they don't get into the level of rigor. Again, start implementing governance and compliance. Uh, people who actually know governance and compliance, not just tacking it onto someone's day job that's not an expert in it, to just start getting better and ramp up. And then a few other notes. When you get these um, assessments in particular, uh, the report language, monitor that. It needs to be fact-based and not alarmist, and do remember that it is going to get produced in discovery if you get sued. Regulators will be more gracious and, and more accommodating to not requesting that because it's in their interest that you do these because they want you to be more secure. Lawyers aren't gonna care. They're gonna ask for them. So whatever that report says, it could come back to bite you. So look at it and or have your lawyer look at it to make sure that it's as tight as you can get it. Um, uh, before you finalize it. And then um, documented gaps and failures. So a lot of assessment reports say, these are all the things you should do to improve. That's a critical part of the process, but that's also going to be um, part of a lawsuit. So make sure that it's written in a way and it's developed in a way that is helpful and doesn't harm you. And with that, I'll wrap. <laughs> so I'll be around all week. If you want to talk about some more stuff, just find me.